Welcome, dear friends, to our retreat reflecting on paintings. A few years ago, I visited the Stede Lake Museum in Amsterdam, and I was fascinated by Kazimir Malevich's painting, Peasant Woman with Buckets and Child. I found it strange, although fascinating, but then I was reminded of a visit to the National Gallery I'd done a few years before with an artist friend. And uh, when we walked around, and well, I didn't think much of a painting, she would stop and say, look, look again. She would say, tell me what you see. Go on, tell me. And I was reminded of W.H. Auden's famous line, how do you know what you think until you see what you say? And in the saying of what you see, you see more. I spoke to this painting a long time, and then I wrote about the characters in it. I've called this reflection bearing up. He took our photograph as we were passing and then asked if it was all right. Malevich, he said his name was. I suppose we don't look like the kind of people you need permission from, do we? I mean, who would be rushing to our door to crave our seal of approval for anything? Do we look like we could endorse fresh air? I've never been asked for my consent for anything, not even my marriage. So, what's a photograph? He explained he was painting the landscape behind us from an aerial perspective, a God's eye view, and went on and on about surveying from above, trying to remap the world as a patchwork quilt Everything he said is a matter of perception. What you see depends on the angle you choose as your slant on the world. He looked, I must say, very dapper in his large red necktie. I could have made a dress for my daughter out of it. And then he told us, by the way, that he was Russian Catholic of Polish parents. Was this his slant, I wondered, his lookout point? I thought, this poor soul is going to take some time, so I unburdened myself of my yoke, landed the two buckets of water at his feet, so I could rest the burning crick of my neck, and he could survey the buckets from, from an aerial perspective. I have a compulsion to help, dear onlooker. What can I tell you? It's in my bent Catholic bones. The artist paused and looked down into the buckets like some blindfolded narcissus, flummoxed at a sudden loss of self. I wonder if he felt cheated that our peasant water, opaque with turbulence, blinded himself to himself. He went on to say he might consider fronting his landscape with the two of us. He promised that if he did use us, he'd surely send a photo of his painting to decorate our family album, like we surely had one. How I love the dafties who think that people like us have volumes of thrilling photographs to make our neighbours fight with envy. As if me and my husband and my daughter have ventured beyond the local marketplace. We've never been to Kiev, which is three hours away. As if we're, we've got ready access to airports international 
and have lays beside blue swimming pools sipping margaritas in the sun. Part of being poor is being stuck where you are, embedded in the landscape, knowing you'll never need to consult a map. To get away from this outpost, we need a plane to take us to the nearest bus route. In our midst, villages, everyone is poor. There's nothing but other people's poverty to compare your own with. The struggle to survive makes everything seem trivial, unworthy. Hardship is our daily concelebration and we all take turns to preside. Don't misunderstand me, I'm not complaining. There is no more worthy liturgy to God on high than the gathered poor breaking the clouds. You will have noticed, I'm sure, dear onlooker, wherever you be in the world, that the needy and the desperate make the best laughter. Only last week, the teacher asked my daughter, if you have three rubles in your left-hand pocket and two rubles in your right-hand pocket, what do you have? My daughter replied, I've got someone else's coat on. How we all laughed at that. <laughs> including the poor teacher. Photographs are for those who travel to exotic places and meet perpendicular people not stooped by drudgery. These people lay down prized moments on which to lean a dull evening. Back home ages hence with time to kill, they can leaf through a gallery of antique monuments fronted by themselves, columns, cenotaphs, palaces, parliaments. And you know, on looking at those photographs, that the borrowed architecture, that solemn background, is suddenly trivial beside this grinning individual. This photo is more valuable than a stamped passport. For this is visual proof of being somewhere else away, away from the slow drip of unchanging days. Look at the pair of us, dear onlooker. Do we look as if we've travelled even in our dreams? We only have one picture in our house, an icon of the sacred heart of Jesus. My beloved husband, my life and my lantern, lights a candle every night before the picture, and the three of us kneel and pray to this wounded man, no stranger to heartache or distress. We pray to him who looks like one of us, that we might manage through tomorrow. Our prayer is humble, only for the morrow, because we are people who've been shaped to nurse humble hopes. So we smiled our consent at Mr. Malevich, the famous artist from Kiev. And when we explained that we didn't have an address, our house has no number, our street has no name, he kindly noted our names and the nearest post office, dispatching us with a promise as we trudged our way home. Of course, we thought we'd never hear from him again, from this famous artist from Kiev. And when we told my husband that evening at supper of our chance meeting with a famous artist, he laughed and said, look, I love you both. But who would be making an icon out of the two of you? I said, dear Carl, you might not recognise us. We could be broken down as landscape, sea, sky. Two months later, we were told to collect a starched envelope from the post office. And when we opened it, gosh, there we were. My daughter, Raisa, and me 
staring back at ourselves. How pleased we were that we'd made it beyond the village at last, even if only on paper. Sure, it's not the photograph Mr. Valovich took, but a photograph of what he made of us and how well he caught us in this trembling moment. I love Mr. Malevich for his perspective on us, truer than any photograph could ever conjure us. Isn't the man a spiritual mastermind? Anthropologists, those experts hungry for conformity, who spend their life cataloguing the herd into groupings, define our tribe by the shape of our shoulders, the burden and strain of bearing up, settling for the hand fate has dealt us, just managing through the day, scraping for a living, carrying our daily cross. All this has pressed down on our shoulders. You must notice our shoulders above all, Mr. Balovich certainly did, how they've been worn down over time from being square-shaped to egg-shaped. We've shifted, pedalled, hawked, carried, lugged, humped, sustained so much over the years that soon our peasants' shoulders will have no grip to bear even the weightless Christ child, should he happen by looking to cross the stream. Our shoulders might as well be ski slopes, steep inclines, for whatever lands to slither down. Soon our sunken spine will press for early retirement and the right to fold itself away after another generation. What will we hold? Oh, we have put our shoulder to the wheel. We've buckled down and buckled under until we are it. all we are now is the legion of the buckled. You notice how I use my neck muscles to carry the yoke that holds the buckets. My husband Karl is the kindest man in all the Russias and works as a village blacksmith. All hammer and tongs he is. He forges farming tools and metal works for wagons, like the iron bands for cartwheels. The fire is lit with charcoal from pine and beech wood, and the water I carry is for his hollowed out beam, which he uses as a quenching trough where fired horseshoes are cooled in winter. Most of his time is spent back, bent, hammering on the anvil, sparking the dark to shape wrought iron shoes for beasts of burden. I tell him we should be shod like them. Look at us. We're all frontal view our bent necks have disappeared from view behind our flattened faces. We are one-dimensional in the tradition of our Russian icons. In our icons, we believe reality cannot be captured. There is no mimicking of the physical world. There are no shadows in our icons because they're a depiction of the mystical. Behind us is a sprawling map where neither rise nor fall is heeded. Everything is on the level, flush, plumb, plain. The punctured hills, the level shore, the glassy sea. You notice the two boats hauled onto the shore have been flattened into black surfboards. Raisa thought they looked like giant footprints left behind by Atlas. Malevich has caught our spirit well in bondage to our flesh and bones. Look, dear onlooker, have a look at our broad backs, 
continue down along our thick-set trunk and legs to the spread of our bare feet and sprawling toes. How I love the artist's flat view of our feet, as if they were grafted onto Mother Earth and needed levering off for fulsome viewing. Our legs are cedars of Lebanon anchored in Ukraine. We have hands to dig like navvies, each iron digit forged to rupture rocks and subjugate the earth. We were created to till the soil, to turn the earth, to bend, to dig, to plough, to plant, to scatter, to wait, to gather, to carry. Infinity of active verbs we are. And there is no subtlety in our body language, no conditional tense. The priest told us at last Sunday's Mass that we are Corpus Christi, the body of Christ. He asked us to think of what happened to Jesus' body, the body that was catapulted into the passive voice, the body that was taken, led away, handed over, abused, stripped, nailed, reviled, and crucified to death. He quoted the lines of a hymn that is my favourite, Come to see his hands and feet, the scars, the scars that speak of sacrifice, hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered. He asked us to think of the eyes, the bruised eyes that look down from the cross with forgiveness. Hear the voice, he said, that bade the crushed people, come to me, all you who labor and are overburdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy. Think, our priest said, of the shoulders that shored up the weight of burdens not his, that caved in under the leaden muscle of the cross. This was his body, the priest said, the body that could not endure anymore and resigned, the body that folded itself into death. Through his body, all our bodies are graced. Never, 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 he said, no matter what shape you are, no matter what shape you're in, belittle or disparage the beauty and glory of your own body. What you were given and who you've become, that is how you grace a broken world. Through body, comes grace. Hard to believe, but Malevich helps me to believe. He calls us the baptized ones, the little people, baptized into the body of Christ, the ones destined to take up their cross and follow the Lord to walk on the Via Dolorosa that winds its ways through our streets and villages. We are the bowed and the bent ones, the bodies appointed to share his suffering and carry the cross on behalf of a fractured world. Malevich even included in his painting the animal that dominates the passion story, the cock that crowed at the high priest's palace and three times arrested poor Saint Peter after he had denied his master and lord. You will have noticed the cock, dear onlooker, head down in the painting at Raisa's right arm. When Peter, leading witness, denied himself and Jesus to the little girl, the doorkeeper 
who monitored all entrances and exits to the palace. It must have sounded to Peter's ear as if every animal in the world was baying and howling at such forsaking of their maker. Sometimes our world is sound, not space. But this cock is not dominant in our story, does not throat his triple accusations or core alarm, but pecks almost invisibly at that thin field of yellow corn. Thank you, Mr. Valovich, for this, for painting us for who we really are with a cock head down at ease beside us. We shoulder our cross on behalf of a world in bits, fractured, levelled, prostrate, the world that Malevich sees so clearly. It is this belief that enables me and Carl and Raisa to trudge on, keep going, even sometimes to work up a smile at those who look on, wondering why. Have a long look at us, dear Oluka, and behold Corpus Christi. Thank you.